change your mind. Tell me, was I supposed to play deaf, dumb, and blind? Why you took the time to find a one of a kind, a miracle? Was I supposed to sit on my hands and shut my mouth while you make your noise and flail about? As if I hadn't worked this puzzle out. Without a doubt, we're crazy lyrical. Now that you found some time away, dreaming of yesterday. When I asked you not to go, no bed you to stay. Tell this fool I'm not the one. Ladies and gentlemen, our panel discussion is commencing. Please switch your electronic devices to silent, but at the same time, be sure to share with the social media world via Instagram and Twitter or platform of your choice at hashtag RM Summit. Day three of the Raw Material Summit 2023 starts now. our host of day three, David Rose. You're supposed to keep the applause going until I get to the chair. Thank you. The walk, get, the walk gets a little bit longer as each summit passes. I get a little bit older, you know? Wonderful. Really good morning, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to day three of the Raw Materials Summit here at the Egg in Brussels. Obviously, as you know, many of you were here with us yesterday, but I'd like to check if I can. Raise a hand, could you please? Get your arms warmed up, you're gonna need them later. Raise a hand if you were here yesterday at the summit. Oh wow, okay. All right, the next bit gets interesting. Raise a hand if you're joining us for the first time today. Right, for those of you joining us for the first time today, a very warm welcome from me to the summit. 
Now, what I want to do to warm us up and get us started this morning, before we move into what's, again, a very vibrant and full program for day three, is I want to actually reach out to you, the audience. Today, we'll have a lot more opportunities for you also to raise your questions to our panels, particularly in our sessions this morning. So I'll urge you already that when we get into discussion after, please be thinking about the questions you want to ask our panels, and I'll be doing a live hands up in the room with you at various points in both the sessions this morning, so we can make it a good interactive start to the day. And I want to kick things off by doing a couple of little Slido polls with you. Slido's up and running now. The issue technically we had yesterday morning is resolved. So what we'll do now is you can see the poll here. Yeah. And this is a first one for you for the summit itself. Obviously, for those of you that were with us yesterday, although those of you who just joined us, you might already be getting value. EIT really want to know whether this summit's useful for you. You know and I know they put a lot of effort into it. So give them your view. Have you got value from the summit so far? A lot? Quite a lot? I'll tell you tomorrow, which would be fair, or not yet. So just take 30 seconds and give us your views on that. <laughs> it's like watching an election, isn't it, on election night on TV. Right, I'm going to pause it there. I think there's a clear picture. Many of you, almost half of you, think there's a lot of value. I'm pleased to hear it. A good third of you almost say a lot. And naturally, I was the one that put in I'll tell you tomorrow, because I'm an I'll tell you tomorrow person. Let's finish the summit, David, and then I'll let you know. And a few of you not yet. Well, for those of you not yet, let's see if we can deliver on that today. Could I ask you, though, as an audience, to just give a round of applause? But wait, wait. I think if you have had that value from the summit, could we give the organizers a round of applause for progress so far, please? <laughs> and then I'll make a promise to you, because I'm leading the sessions, but I'm not moderating all of them today. But as always, I'll be here quite present on stage. And I promise that we'll try again today to make it another good day for you. With that in mind, a second poll I want to look at. Now, many of you did a poll yesterday morning with me asking about the Critical Raw Materials Act. But I noted with interest that even some of our speakers on stage voiced the idea their opinions were shifting slightly based on some of the sessions they'd seen. So not for the sake of repetition, but for the sake of progress, I want to repeat the same poll, the poll we looked at yesterday. How satisfied are you with the proposed Critical Raw Materials Act? So if you voted yesterday, vote again today, even if it's the same vote, please. And I'll give you again 30 seconds here to share your views on this. Interesting for me, the results. I think this is consistent with a lot of the outputs we saw in our sessions yesterday. There's a good amount of you that are satisfied, but a significant majority of people are still a little bit in between, still have concerns about various areas, such as skills, such as financing, such as other areas we touched upon yesterday and we'll dig further into today. So, okay, that's a good start to the day with you giving your views. As I said, I'll keep coming back to you as an audience this morning. But what I want to do now is get straight down to business with our first session. So if we can now transition into our first session today, which is why Europe must embrace the return of raw materials. Now, we heard yesterday one of the things that also came up was about social acceptance. It's something a lot of people raised on different panels as a challenge that we need to overcome. And the focus of the session, this first session, is going to be very much in that area of tackling the social acceptance issue but not theoretically, in a highly practical manner. In the, we're actually going to look in the session not just at practical learnings from real projects people have been doing in that area, but also take a look at the communications strategy side of things, about how can we really get practical about dealing with the issue of social acceptance. Now, we're going to do this in a couple of steps. First things first, we've got a video address from Vice President Sefcovic from the European Commission. 
It's a video recording which we'll play for you in a moment, giving his keynote. Then I'll call up the panel. I'll have a round of questions with the panel. Then I'll come straight to you, our audience, for hands up with the microphones in the room for your questions. We'll go back to our panel and hopefully a second round with you, the audience. So with that in mind, let's get straight down with the video, the video address from Vice President Sefcovic. We're going to rerun. Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's try that again. Let's hear the keynote video address from Vice President Sefko. <laughs> Good morning. It is a pleasure to be opening the final day of this event. My thanks to the EIT Raw Materials for inviting me. There is no doubt that uh, we live in an increasingly contested geopolitical world. But the EU's growth strategy remains anchored around the two key transformations, the move to climate neutrality by 2050 and our embracing of the digital age. And that all begins with the critical minerals, because any technological advancement in either area is dependent on access to those raw materials. Without them, there is simply no green or digital transition. Take batteries, a key net zero technology that is reliant on a steady supply of different raw materials. Under the European Battery Alliance, we brought together more than 800 industrial and innovation stakeholders to reinvigorate uh, the industry. By the end uh, of last year, total investment in Europe's uh, battery ecosystem passed 180 billion euros including 160 industrial projects along the entire value chain with 30 announced lithium-ion gigafactories. However, the competitiveness of the EU's booming battery industry is now being put at risk. Not only by more assertive industrial policies worldwide, boosting clean tech industrial capacities in a way that alters the level playing field, but also by higher energy prices caused by Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. This, in turn, is amplifying existing structural challenges like our dependence on imports of uh, critical raw materials, because, for example, Europe is only able to cater for 1% of the global production of key battery raw materials. And this trend is set to accelerate Demand for rare earth metals is expected to be up to five times higher by 2030 and six times higher by 2050. While demand for lithium is expected to be 12 times uh, greater by 2030 and 21 times higher by 2050. With that in mind, uh, we cannot fall into a future trap of becoming over dependent on any one supplier or technology for our economy. For instance, the EU's heavy dependence on China at various stages of the battery value chain, including raw and processed materials, increases the risk of disruptions amidst heightened global competition. According to recent uh, analysis, Chinese manufacturers are set to triple their share of the EU EV market to 15% by 2025. So, there is a clear need for far-reaching policy action to boost the competitiveness of Europe's economy. To meet that need, the European Commission has made significant strides in recent years towards uh, securing a stable, long-term and sustainable supply of critical raw materials for Europe's economy and society. From the Action Plan on Critical Raw Materials adopted in 2020 to the European Raw Materials Alliance under EIT Raw Materials using the European Battery Alliance as a blueprint and the Clean Technologies Task Force. And earlier this year, we put forward several major initiatives aimed at addressing these concerns, including the Critical Raw Materials Act, to help ensure stable access to the critical minerals 
while still to manufacture key net zero technologies. On the one hand, the Act aims to boost domestic mining, processing and refining capacities in Europe. By 2030, we want our own capacities to reach at least 10% of domestic demand for mining, 40% for refining and 15% for recycling. Therefore, we have proposed that Member States be required to provide all critical raw materials projects with a one-stop shop for all relevant permits. We have further proposed that uh, projects both inside and outside the EU contributing to our capacities across all value chain stages be eligible for a strategic project status. This would allow them to benefit from streamlined permitting and enabling conditions for access to finance. We should also make the most of the untapped golden opportunity of recycling with only 20% of the estimated 50 million tons of e-waste produced each year being formally recycled. But at the same time, we are aware that Europe's domestic supply will not be able to fully meet our needs for critical minerals. So on the other hand, the Act is designed to help us diversify sources of supply by building or strengthening global partnerships with like-minded countries, those who also take sustainability seriously. That is why our recently concluded agreements, such as those with New Zealand and Chile, have dedicated raw materials chapters. We have also signed strategic partnerships with Canada, Kazakhstan, Namibia, Ukraine and Norway. Ladies and gentlemen, critical raw materials will play a crucial role in building the EU's future green and digital economy. As we go about that work, our guiding principle must be to boost Europe's open strategic autonomy. In other words, we must keep working to minimize our strategic dependencies on systemic rivals, something of a great relevance when it comes to critical raw materials. That means working together to ensure the success of responsible mining in Europe. I look forward to our future cooperation and I wish you a pleasant final day of the conference. Thank you. So we've heard some framing comments there from the Commission perspective underlying this desire for Europe to bring home a good part of its raw materials with these ambitious targets in the Critical Raw Materials Act. With this in mind, let's get straight down to our panel now. It gives me great pleasure. Welcome them with a big round of applause, please, our panellists for our first session. Good morning, everyone. As you can see on the screen here, joining me is Ruben Schiffman, the Executive Chairman of Greenland Resources, Peter Pakowski, the President and CEO of Eurolithium, Stefan De Bruyne, the Director of External Affairs at SQM, Julia Poliskanova, the Senior Director for Vehicles and E-Mobility at Transport and Environment, Joshua Mayer, the Service Business Line President at FLS Smith, and Maria Westervand, the CEO of Milton Europe. And Maria is bringing her, us her vast political and communications experience to the debate as well. So let's get straight down to things with a quick round of questions for you. Keep your answers brief as we agreed, so we've got time for our questions from the audience. And audience, be thinking about the questions you want to ask, because I'm coming straight to you afterwards. So first things first then, Ruben. Yeah. So in terms of experience on community engagement, you've got the um, Molybdenum mining project in Greenland. And, and you've had other previous projects as well. What I really want to know, I think what our audience will be dying to hear is, what are your key learnings from this in terms of dealing with social acceptance and related issues? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I must say that the key learning is that actions speak louder than words. And you have a narrow window with the communities to execute whatever you tell them that you're going to do. In the past, we did a very successful mining, a social ingredient mining project in Latin America was a Canadian listed company. We went to a community that were very poor, 
They were artisanal miners. They were very skeptical of doing a deal with a Western country. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we, um, I managed to convince my partners there was as much communication with the community as with the shareholders in Canada. Um, so we managed to convince them. We put them into an association, around 60 families, gave them one share certificate, 25% of the company, money, promised them jobs, two seats on the board. Most of the community haven't even been to their main cities. We have a very high level skilled uh, board in Canada. We had a former federal minister of, of trade. We had a former chairman of a bank and the two artisanal miners. We started a drilling program. Immediately we raised money in the capital markets. It was very successful. Two years later, we sold the company for 10 times the money of the IPO. The poor community made over $35 million. We changed their life. And this is the power of mining. We can create wealth, create in a responsible manner. And so that was one successful social ingredient project. In Greenland, the dynamics are a little bit different because the GDP per capita in Greenland is larger than in Belgium and in Canada. So uh, the Danes uh, really take care of the Greenland people, I should say. And, uh, and, and so people on the East Coast where we are, they really want skills. They want to change their skills and acquire new skills. The, 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 the economic side is important, but it's a, it's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. So we have now concur conducting our stakeholders meetings with the, um, with the communities in terms of the, of the exploitation license to get a permit there. The project is a project that can probably sell around $800 million a year for 20 years, supply 25% of the molybdenum demand for Europe. Europe doesn't have molybdenum and is the second largest user. So it's an important for Europe, for the communities. The idea there, we've signed off over, um, I should say, legal obligations, above legal obligations agreements where we're giving them money to do whatever they need. We sign deals with the mining school to train them in the local communities. The fishermen and hunting guys are very happy because they're going to fish and hunt more and make more money for 500 people. And the new generations are going to acquire new skills like operators, electricians, eventually geologists, eventually engineers. That is the power of mining. Okay, clear messages there for me. I'm interested in the first example you gave where you, you, it sounds to me like you almost had a deliberate equal balance between external communication to balance the internal communication with shareholders, board, investors, etc. And I notice you've underlined there both economic value it can bring, but also the socio-economic value in terms of skills, upskilling, and other areas. So thanks, Ruben. Um, Petter, moving on to you. I know you've been dealing for some years now. We talked about it previously with your very strategic borate and lithium mining project in Serbia. Um, what are your reflections and experiences about public acceptance, linking what we've just heard from Ruben, about your project in Serbia? Mm -hmm. Well, let me start by thanking you know, EIT and Bern and team for all of us being here. It's very important to get the message out. Mm. Um, with respect to myself, I arrived in the Balkans in 2008. Uh, the idea was to try and find a lithium borate deposit. Mm. We spent a lot of years looking in the Balkans, uh, in Bosnia, in Srpska, in Serbia itself. And in the end, we're fortunate to find what we're now trying to understand if it is or is not an economic deposit. Yeah. And that's a tremendous amount of work, of course. And you know, my background is not mining. I'm not a miner or mining engineer. I'm a marine biologist by education. And in my last venture in business, I actually was involved in the paint industry, in the chemical industry, and I changed it from being solvent-based to being waterborne. Mm -hmm. And the water in this bottle um, is clean, but it can carry all the chemistry you need in terms of mm -hmm. you know, the paint industry. Mm -hmm. But it's much safer to use, much easier to use, there's a lot of benefits because you don't have any solvents involved. So my idea of going to the Balkans was actually to try and see if there was a possibility of finding a resource that could accelerate the changeover from fossil, free, fossil free fuel use yeah. to electrification of mobility and infra in infrastructure. And that's really what I'm working on. And the project took a, you know, a, a lot of years to try and find something which may be economic. And at the moment, we're, we're going through those studies. But what, what's important when you have a project, especially something like this one, which is family owned, I mean, it's myself, my kids are involved, et cetera, is that you need to be a member of the society. And you need to explain very clearly what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because everyone's afraid of a closet in a dark room. But if you open the doors to the closet and explain what is you're up to, 
So how, how specifically with your project did you bridge that information gap? It, it's about being involved in the community. It's about being present. It's about explaining things openly and having an open door. For example, we have a, an information center where people are welcome to come, sit down, have a coffee, and discuss whatever questions they may have. And then we'll address those questions. Also, while you're in the community, you need to be a participant. You know, what can I do while I'm here and, to, and, and working? What can I do to, a, to show you who I am, but also what do you need that I can help you with, perhaps? Yes, I may be looking for a resource, but I'm also present every day. Mm -hmm. So what is it that I can do while I'm here yeah. in, the, in, the, in the course to maybe leave something of a benefit? And were there a number, could, could you nominate maybe a couple of specific things that you did find in that area where you could bring value through your project as well? Uh, you know, we are now working in Serbia. It's, it's where, where, where we are focused on, on a discovery in Valjevo. Mm -hmm. And it's about the infrastructure in the city and the city itself and what is it that that city perhaps needs and what can we bring to the city mm -hmm. as, a, if you will, a member of that society. Okay, cool. And so it's about the kids, it's about the infrastructure, it's about community, sports, et cetera, and understanding the culture yeah. and re always remembering you're a guest, it's their homeland. You're a guest. Behave like one. Take your yeah, shoes so off. It's a mindset approach from you. I can see very clearly it comes across. Yes. Your approach is, is from the very beginning that you, you're looking to build that partnership and communicate that you're building that partnership yes. as well. Why are you here? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you hoping for? And, and what, can I, what can I offer you know, while I'm here with you? Clear, clear. Right, thanks. Thanks, Peter. So, Stefan, I'll move on to you now. Um, and Obviously, you're running extractive activities outside of Europe as a company. Uh, what's your approach in terms of social license to operate? Thank you, David. Um, let me start with a, a very quick personal anecdote. Um, I joined Eskom in 2005, that's exactly 18 years ago, uh, to sell two little-known chemicals in Asia called lithium and iodine. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine something like uh, this. Um, Eskimo is the biggest uh, lithium producer in the world. Uh, we're doing so as part of a public-private partnership together with the Chilean uh, government, uh, exporting our products, battery-grade lithium hydroxide, lithium carbonate, globally. Um, and there was a lot of numbers about lithium uh, mentioned yesterday. I'd, I'd like to give you the latest stats. So uh, the EU imported 22,000 ton of lithium chemicals last year. That's 3% of the global lithium chemical demand. 63% uh, of that came from Chile. If you look going forward, the German Raw Materials Agency estimates a demand, domestic EU demand of 425,000 ton. They anticipate 100 to 150,000 ton could be produced domestically in Europe, which means Europe will need to rely on overse overseas strategic partners uh, like SQM and Chile uh, going forward. The rising lithium demand puts a huge responsibility on all producers, current and uh, upcoming. And so uh, from our um, side, it's important to scale fast, to do so with the lowest possible footprint, um, have horizontal uh, dialogue with your local stakeholders. There needs to be local value sharing. There needs to be transparency, highest mining standards. It's a, a huge um, task. We're committed to that. Um, I think we have tripled our output in the last three years in the refinery in Antofagasta. At the same time, we have reduced brine extractions by more than 20%, mm. freshwater extractions by more than uh, 50%. Mm. We want to become the most sustainable lithium producer in the world. We think we have the right attributes to achieve that vision. However, there's no mine without impact. And so the question is, how do we define the mining of the future. And that brings me specifically to, to your question and the social license to operate. Um, there's no easy answer on how you do that. Um, I think it takes a very holistic uh, commitment on all aspects, E, S, and G. You need to be transparent, accountable. Uh, you need to have a genuine horizontal uh, communication. Uh, there needs to be value sharing. Um, and, and as has been mentioned, you have to listen to the people and really take on board what they say. And then it's very important for our local communities that they can invest in their future uh, and, and their future clarify, development. I mean, you mentioned, and I think it's the thing that everybody on the panel and many in our audience would definitely agree with, this idea that you've got to listen. It can't be a one-way communication. It has to be very much a two-way one, but a two-way one that's not top-down, but very much more on an even keel. But I'm very interested to know on a practical level from your side, 
How do you, uh, at what stage in the process do you initiate that listening? And how exactly do you do it? I can give you an example of a mistake we made. Um, okay. Because what you said, if you would go back five or seven years, we would interpret that as if, if local people have questions about the hydrogeology, mm. so what happens underground, we would uh, organize a presentation and our experts would present. Um, that may sound great, but it's wrong. So you have to uh, define how you're going to discuss this with the local communities who will be there. You need to provide them, if you're talking about something that they don't have expertise about, you need to provide them with the funds to hire their independent consultants. Mm. And you cannot have an, an, a business mindset. This is another time frame you need to allow for multiple interactions mm. um, to reach uh, ultimately common ground. Yeah, there's always that intrinsic risk, isn't there? If if the communication is from that business perspective to a more general public audience or a mixed stakeholder audience, that sometimes we're transmitting on slightly different frequencies to each other. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, indeed. And well, you thanks, need to thanks. keep that in mind all the time. Clear, very clear. Julia, I'll move on to you now. So um, I'm obviously embracing mining in Europe. It's very much connected with the, uh, the targets of electrification of transport, something you hold very dear, obviously, at transport and environment. Um, What's your view, building on what we've heard about the topic of communicating positively to, to people within the EU, to everyday people? I hate to use the term citizens. It echoes a, a communist past to me, which... Uh, anyway, people. I'll use the term people. Yes, absolutely. Uh, great question and, and really pleasure to, to be here. What an excellent summit so far. So maybe as, as an intro, I actually wanted to challenge the name of this panel about the return of raw materials. Raw materials didn't go anywhere. They are at the basis of, of our society, have been iron technologies and will be going forward. And maybe the first thing to say is that we just uh, we, we need to embrace it. We also need to be honest about the trade-offs. There is no such thing as zero emission or zero impact mining, but what we can do is actually make that impact a lot lower. And here I wanted to come to a first key message that I wanted to make today, and that's the technologies and the practices to make extraction, uh, refining, etc., cetera, um, lower impact, a clean, sustainable, responsible are all there. We can talk about an environmental side, for example, about dry or filtered tailings method, about the new ways to recover lithium from brines, which is not just bad environmentally, it also opens up an entire new supply potential, for example, for Europe to have lithium, etc. And on the engagement with communities, we have practices. We know how to do it. And actually, companies here today already mentioning them. Yesterday, we heard from Imaris exactly how we do that, right? So it's really about that keyword partnerships. Now, the second and the last key message I want to make is specifically answering your, your question maybe about communications. Last week, I, I had a really great pleasure to also be at the Financial Times Automotive Summit with many, many car companies, battery makers, and the debate there a lot was also about local uh, community supply chains, for example. The CEO of ICMM, so the International Council on Mining and Metals, made a brilliant stat. He said, so 5,000 thousand mines in various critical metals are planned around the world, there will be enough, and 65% of those in Europe and beyond, mostly globally, are actually in one way or another on indigenous people's land. Mm -hmm. So it's not just something that, you know, is an afterthought. Whether we like it or not, we have to do this differently and we have to incorporate it into our policies. So more specifically today for me, when we talk about the Critical Raw Materials Act, what does this mean? First of all, it means that as part of the entire framework, we should actually codify <coughs> the free and prior and informed consent declaration and the relevant ILO standard into the critical raw materials act. It's missing, it's not in the annexes, it should be there. That's what communities want to see. And secondly, when we talk about the certification schemes, well, first of all, we don't believe that the compliance should be based on certification schemes, but even if we, uh, we do acknowledge them, this should in incorporate that idea of partnerships with local authorities. That means that only schemes that have multi-stakeholder governance, that actually involve local communities, trade unions, et cetera, should be actually counted as a strong mechanisms as part of CRM Act. And today, any, any mechanism goes, and, and that's just not, not good enough. 
So I'll leave it there. Okay. A clear point there about the things you think are missing from the Act and how they can be enhanced in this area. And you also made the point, which links in very nicely with what I'm going to ask Joshua in a moment. You mentioned that the technology is there, and I think, Joshua, you're nodding because you know the technology is there. You've got some of it. Now, I know FLS Smith is developing sustainable technologies for the mining sector. Can you give us a couple of examples, maybe, of what they are and, and really the power, how they can really impact on, on mining in a positive way? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you again uh, for, for having me here. <clears throat> maybe just a two-second intro to who we are as FL Smith. Um, for those who aren't quite as familiar with the sector, uh, FL Smith is a 140-year-old Danish company, <clears throat> and we're the leading uh, supplier to the mining industry from a mineral processing perspective. So it is a, a, almost a certainty that any mineral uh, metal uh, that, uh, that you consume at some stage was processed on FLS equipment around the world. Mm -hmm. So we play a key role in, in, in this dialogue, and we've, we've invested extremely heavily in the technologies to make mining more sustainable. Um, but before we talk about the what are we doing or what are those technologies available, I, I think I'd like to quickly go back to a point that was made earlier about the image of, of the mining sector. And I think that that image is one of the critical elements that Europe, that the world, that anyone involved with the green agenda is going to encounter. So the, the, the failings of us as a mining sector to create a positive image are becoming a obstacle for the global green agenda. Um, if you look at the role that minerals play, I think it's no doubt we're talking about uh, the, the battery minerals and, and critical minerals for, for uh, the green agenda, but it applies across the, the entirety of, of, of human society. And it is impossible for us, as was pointed out, to, to achieve the goals of the Paris uh, Accord. And at the same time, it is undeniable that there is no clean, perfect way of extracting minerals from the ground. Now, the technology does exist um, to do that in a much more sustainable way. So back in 2019, we made a commitment called Mission Zero. Um, and what Mission Zero essentially said was that by 2030, we would have the equipment available to enable a mine to process with net zero emissions, with zero water waste, and with zero energy waste. And we've, uh, many of those technologies already exist today. Uh, if we look at you know, one of the, the things that has created probably the worst piece of the image, um, it, it's, it's tailing stamps. Today, the technology exists to eliminate 95 plus percent of the water uh, through dry stack tailings, for example. Yep. Um, and if we do not leverage those technologies, if we do not improve the image of the mining sector, we simply won't advance. And to put it in as a kind of a closing on this in perspective, uh, there were several recent studies, um, one performed last year, put mining at the very bottom of all uh, industries uh, listed in that survey. Below tobacco, below oil and gas, mining was considered uh, essentially a scourge to society. That's a very sad place to be when we are foundational, fundamental, yeah required for society to advance. Yeah, I think we can more or less agree there's definitely a need for a rebranding. But at the same time, I think it's quite striking what you've just said, to, to see mining actually placed below tobacco in public perception uh, as an industry is a worrying thing to hear, quite frankly, when we also think about what we've been talking about the last day or more here at the Raw Materials <laughs> Summit, about how we need more mining in Europe the Critical Raw Materials Act is asking for 10% more domestic mining, yet so as we ramp this up, we'll only amplify this, this issue we have or perception problem. Well, talking about that, and I'll link in now if I can with, uh, with you, Maria. I mean, obviously, you know, we know that communication is crucial in building trust and social license to operate. Now, I know you've got a, a long background both as a politician but also as a communications expert and specialist. So drawing on that and building on what we've heard, it, are we getting it right at the moment? It appears we're not. And what can we improve? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, thanks a lot for inviting me to mm. speak here. I'm very happy to participate. Um, my background is actually in politics. I was the leader of the Swedish Green Party for <coughs> nine years and a member of the Swedish Parliament for 10 years. 
And uh, since I left politics 12 years ago, I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to improve the communications between politicians and industry. And it, I must say that it was a bit scary in the beginning, like going over to the evil side and start listening to industry. But I think it has been a very interesting experience because I realized that first thing, uh, politicians have a lot of prejudices against industry, and not least uh, from my own uh, movement, the Green Movement. But industry also does not really understand politics. So I think there, there is really, really a need for better dialogue between these two parties. And uh, that goes also, I would say, for, for the communication between industry and society, and not least in these industries. And, there are good examples and there are bad examples to answer your questions. We've heard a bit about good examples of uh, getting local communities uh, acceptance for different kinds of projects. Uh, but there are also quite a lot of bad examples where communication has not been very successful. And I think that uh, what we need to do here is to uh, improve the level of the discussion to get it to a higher intellectual level because we have a problem today with populism and that goes for like all the sides of a debate more or less and we also have a problem that everyone is super comfortable in their own corner or in their own bubble they talk to each other and they have this idea that you know we are the ones who are right and if maybe we can send the information better to those in the other corner, they will understand that we are you know, perfect already. And those on the other side, they think they have the right opinion, and they believe that maybe if they inform enough, they can uh, get the other ones to understand. You're reminding, me, uh, you're reminding me of a phrase here that comes into my mind. Can you raise a hand if you're Italian or an Italian speaker, please? Anybody in the room? All right. <laughs> Correct my pronunciation if I'm wrong. Tu hai ragione, ma io non ho torto. <laughs> you know that one. You're right, but I'm not wrong. <laughs> it's a phrase that keeps coming up again yeah, and again yeah. when we talk about political to industry, industry to communities, politicians to communities. Yeah. And I think that's really what you're saying, isn't it, Maria, to a degree? Yeah, what I want, I, I want everyone to get uh, from their corners out into the yeah. middle of the room and start talking right, to each let other. Let me play devil's advocate here before I open up to the audience. How? How? Practically, yeah. concretely, if there were one or two major recommendations, priorities, yeah, how? How do we break it? Yeah, first recommendation is to not see communication as a one-way communication, like you sending message out to someone else, but communication, in this case, needs dialogue. It needs listening, because if you don't listen to the concerns of those people who have maybe an opposing opinion, uh, you will never be able to address them in the correct way. Okay. And I would say, I would give one example. Look at the forest industry. They were in a really good position from a green point of view, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, when you started to talk about the solutions to climate change. And then they sort of messed it up a bit, I would say. Uh, and one thing they, they did, if I look from the Nordic perspective, I come from the Nordics, I've lived in Sweden and Finland, they talked about forest industry as the solution. They talked about replacing fossil fuels with bio-based products. Mm -hmm. And that's not wrong, but what they missed in that communication was the fact that our materials consumption, the re resource consumption of this society is unsustainable already now. Even and if we would replace fossil fuels with only bio-based, it would have a huge impact on biodiversity in forests. And I would say it's the same with this discussion. I was here today, yesterday for a couple of sessions, and I heard a lot of discussion about how can we get more mines and how can we improve recycling and get more raw materials. There was only one person I heard, at least, who talked about can we innovate and find new solutions that means that we can actually use less raw materials in the future than we do today. If you don't address the sort of elephant in the room, which is the huge consumption of resources that we have in the society, I think you will never be able to understand each other either. Yeah. And when you've addressed that, you would probably realize, yes, it's unsustainable, but we still need uh, mining for a couple of decades more before we have enough raw materials in the loop to be able to just recycle, and then we might need a little bit less. And then when you've agreed on that, you might realize that, yeah, maybe it's better if we do it here and face our own environmental problems and just keeping them somewhere else. And then you can start the discussion about where. And that will make, I think, the discussion much easier. OK, clear, clear.
Right, I want to open up to you now. Have got any questions in the room for our speakers at this stage? If you have, raise a hand, please. Let me see you. Yep, I see one over here, just the one so far. Can we get a microphone, please? As yesterday, please, can we avoid lengthy statements from the floor just to respect our time? So if you can get in, identify yourself and give us your question, please. Thank you. Pat Storm, Marvin Minerals, junior minor. Mainly a question to Maria. President, Vice President Sefcovic mentioned the fact that they're looking to a one-stop shop for permitting. Now, given your experience as a legislator and politician, the mining legislations in Europe are so diverse even in Germany, there's a lender issue. Is this doable, or is it just wishful thinking? <laughs> um, uh, One-stop shop for permits. I think you can do a lot to speed up permitting processes without uh, decreasing uh, environmental responsibility. <clears throat> I think there is a lot to do. The question is, if you speed up the pro permitting processes for mining, what will happen to permitting processes for every other activity that we also need to do in the society? There might be a conflict there, I can see, because we, we don't have, I mean, unlimited amounts of public officials who can handle those cases, but I'm quite sure it's possible to speed up. But we should also be happy that we live in a democracy, because when you get these complaints or that opposition, you will also always notice the flaws maybe in your planning, and you will improve, and you will make it better, and you have to take that into account, which is much better than just you know, uh, living in a dictatorship where you might get a permit super quick, but you will never know if there is a problem, and you might end up in trouble in the end. OK. Any, any further questions? I've got a couple myself. OK, right, I'll dive in with these. So I'm going to pick up on a couple of things quickly, and then we'll wrap up the session and we'll bring things together. So, um, Pedro, I want to come back to you qu quickly here. Um, you talked a little bit before, obviously, about, about your project. And I'm a big fan always of not just what we should do, but what we shouldn't do and why. Yes. So in terms of lessons learned, what are your do's and what are your big do's and don'ts, maybe, that you'd bring in? I mean, begin by understanding that you don't know everything. That's number one. Like, just admit the fact that you just don't know everything. Yeah. Listen to everyone's opinions and ideas, put them together, and then ask yourself, okay, what have I learned and how can I apply it? Mm. So take that approach, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, y y you need to behave like it's yours and you're a guest and you're going to build it together. It's mm -hmm. very important. This has to be a community effort. Mm -hmm. if, if, in the mining business, which I have not been a part of my entire life, but this project here, you are bringing something to people which they've seen in the past as being destructive, as being, uh, if you will, scary, as leaving a legacy of, 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 of things that really shouldn't be the way they are. And so think outside the box. Are there opportunities to do something where I can either A, improve the situation which exists already, mm -hmm. can I utilize the infrastructure which is in place for better use, and can I do this so it's truly sustainable on every level, yeah. on the human level, on the environmental level, and on the personal level? It's very, very important. OK. I'm seeing big nods there. I'm assuming that's something you very much agree with, too. Absolutely. Anything uh, you'd add? So if, if I, I'm thinking from the technology perspective, um, and <clears throat> back to how do we leverage technologies, if, if I look at what exists today from a technological perspective, we can for, forget new greenfield mines for a minute, even existing mines, we can have tremendous impacts mm -hmm. on improving the sustainability footprint. Um, I mean, I, if I look at a couple of really tangible, simple examples, if you migrate, now this is the extreme end, but if you migrate a, 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 a traditional mine to input crushing and conveying, if I look at the scale and scope of a large copper mine, for example, the, the, the energy reduction is the equivalent to over 55,000 vehicles on the road in one single mine. It's the equivalent from an emissions perspective. It's the, it's the equivalency in terms of CO2 emissions, uh, or sorry, of energy consumption of 32,000 homes. Um, now, that's an extreme end, but if I look at some of the small technologies, uh, our high pressure grinding rolls, it's one piece of the equation in, the, in a flow sheet one upgrade on, uh, to the latest and greatest technology on a high pressure grinding roll can reduce energy consumption and improve throughput by 20%. Now, if I look at a mid-size or large mine where maybe there's 10 or 12 of those, that's the equivalency on one small piece of a flow sheet of removing 8,000 vehicles from the road. So the, the implications 
because of the scale and magnitude of mining, can be phenomenal if we leverage what's already available today. Clear, clear, okay. Um, Julia, I'll come to you. Um, again, I think maybe just bring it together a little bit with learnings. I mean, there's been a big debate and a long running debate about electrification, obviously of transport. Is there anything we can bring there to the critical raw materials area? Yes, absolutely. So most of my time, and our time as TNE, we actually spend working on, on, on zero emissions transport, such as electric vehicles. A number of lessons there. First of all, overall for this agenda, strong targets matched by funding is what makes it work. So it's great in Sierra Mac to see some targets. I think they should be actually made strong and linked to strategic project selection. But we are missing a European investment agenda into this. France announced its critical uh, raw materials fund, for example. We really believe this space for a European critical raw materials fund to support some of these sustainable and responsible projects. Another learning is around transparency and enforcement. I will not spend time telling you about the Dieselgate scandal in the vehicle emission space, but that has been revolutionary for what we're seeing today in electrification. And, and here I just would like to really echo what I said, what was really said before as well, consistently applying high standards pays back. And I really would like to make a plea to all of you, because there's so many companies here, do not uh, try to water down the <coughs> current corporate sustainability due diligence directive, three Ds. It's in your interest. A disclosure is coming. Be the first to embrace it, and it will pay back. And the last thing to mention, I'm really happy, Maria, you raised this around demand reduction. I wanted to make that point. The debate around how big cars are, what the batteries are, is huge in the EV debate today, because people are really concerned about all of those huge electric SUVs driving around. I will only add a few numbers to what Maria said here. Demand is not a given. We as a consumer continent can impact the demand. So if we look at our demand for lithium, for example, if we go for um, smaller batteries, I'm not talking about everyone going on a bus, just a smaller battery of 40 or 50 kilowatt hours. And, and we also go for some new technologies, especially for small, uh, <clears throat> for small cars, we, for example, use sodium iron, we can reduce our nickel demand by a third and our lithium demand by a quarter. Just contrast that to the 10% of uh, domestic mining target and how hard we, we say it is. So there's this huge potential that we need to look beyond silos and look at it as a system, not just looking at one area versus the other one. Clear, Julia, thanks. And, and Maria, I'm gonna to come to you. Uh, I mean, obviously, I think we've got some clear points coming out of the discussion about what we do and what we don't do in terms of social license to operate, building engagement. Um, but the interesting thing for me, maybe the unanswered question for me, which we're gonna to have to touch upon before we finish, is who does it? Because there seems to be a little bit of an assumption that's always industry's role to do this communication, yet Europe's launched a Critical Raw Materials Act, U Europe's putting forward a Green Deal, yeah. and all the interconnected parts of this. So where, where do you feel that the actual responsibility or balance of responsibility lies in terms of communicating all of this to people? Yeah, I, I think uh, that depends, of course, if there is a specific project that company who is responsible for that project has a huge responsibility to yeah. sort of run the communications and drive the dialogue and listen and everything like that. But when it comes to the overall issue of how we actually uh, use resources in society and where to get those resources that we need to build our welfare system and to drive the green transition and everything like that, I think it's not the responsibility mm. mainly of the individual companies, mm. but it's the responsibility of politicians to lift that discussion to a higher intellectual level and start talking about, try, try to find out what are the real conflicts about about, because sometimes we believe that there are conflicts that do not exist. Okay. I, maybe you think that the other side, they don't understand that we need raw materials. Of course they understand that we need raw materials. Hmm. They might just have a different opinion. But I, but I would question, them. outside of the bubble of this room, yeah. right? I think how, how many people in the general YouTube. public have any idea of what volume of new materials yeah. we need? I mean, that, that, that <laughs> I don't think that everybody needs to understand the exact amounts of how much raw materials we need, but I think there needs to be a dialogue and a discussion about uh, the fact that if we want to be more resilient, 
if we want to drive the green transition, that means that we also need resources to do that, and it needs to be extractive industries in Europe, we need to improve recycling, we need to develop our industry, and uh, that will also mean a larger environmental impact. Yeah. And we need to start weighing local impact against global impact. Okay, so let me come back to the who then. So clearly, I think we can all agree that, that for specific projects, the company has a, a primary responsibility to communicate with its stakeholders. So you're, am I correct in understanding that you're also advocating that then that Europe should be more proactive and more effective in actually communicating the wider societal messages here about green transition, about environmental impact, about trade-offs as well? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think the European <coughs> Union is quite, quite good at that in the way that there are a lot of you know, public consultations, but maybe it needs to be brought up to a little bit more societal level so that more people get involved in discussing okay. this, because it will be a huge issue for the coming couple of decades for yeah. Europe. I think we can all agree that the issue won't get smaller as time no, goes on. No, 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 definitely right. not. I'm looking at time started. and I'm looking at progress, so it's time to wrap up now, because we've got another panel waiting before the break as well. So I'm gonna just go across the panel here and just get you one or two takeaway messages for our room on, on our focus today in this session, obviously on why Europe must embrace the return of raw materials. So I'll go a little bit in the order we started with. Uh, Ruben, I'll come to you first. One or two really quick, and by quick I mean one minute or less, just key takeaway messages, please. Yeah, so we just signed a deal with a major um, buyer of molybdenum in Europe. Molybdenum hasn't been in Europe for the past 60 years, so it's actually a re-entry. Um, it's the second largest user of this uh, metal. Europe and doesn't have it. And it, they will have it now. EIT Raw Material was a big contributor in making this happen. And uh, they've been sponsoring us. Um, so uh, EU associate country is now going to be able to provide to the EU steel industry uh, molybdenum. You can have the Green Deal without molybdenum. Uh, so thanks to EIT Raw Material for that. OK, noted. Peter? Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to maybe give a plug to Serbia and the Serbs. Uh, I have to say they have been extremely welcoming and supportive of all the work I've been doing there for 15 years. Mm. And everyone in this room and on the planet actually realizes that we need to make changes. Mm. And it's, it's evident all around us. And we have the capacity and the technology to do that. So we need to get at doing that now. Mm. Uh, the time is nigh. And as long as what you're bringing to the society you're working within and the population at large, and they can see the benefit, they can touch it, feel it, isn't some high level discussion, it's real, it's on the ground. They can see that you've actually done something properly, whether it's helping granny across the street mm. or helping some community you know, with some event, then they know that you actually mean your talk and you walk your talk. And it's very important, I think, for people to look you in the eye and understand whether you're, whether you're an employee or, or, you know, or the boss, whatever, or an investor, but they need to know that you're sincerely trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And I think that's the message that the mining industry, which I'm gladly not a part of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, can, can convey now to the world and say, look, these things are necessary, and here's the attempt we're making to do it right. Okay. So I think that's very important. Crystal clear. Stefan? I believe a win-win is possible. Mm -hmm. I heard some pessimistic um, challenges, but I'm very optimistic. Uh, if you look at Chile, last year there was $5 billion value sharing from SQM to the government and the local stakeholders. I think it's about listening. Uh, we know that water is very important to stakeholders, and this is why we presented our innovation roadmap um, for water-neutral lithium production, combining DLE with advanced evaporation technologies um, and seawater uh, adduction and diesel plants listening to the stakeholders and defining what is the mining of the future and it will be better and technology has a chance to solve our mess. Okay, crystal clear. Joshua? Um, I guess two messages. Uh, I'll go back to your question around uh, the, the role of communications. I do think, uh, given the, the, the magnitude of the hill we have to climb, um, if there is any chance of success for minerals growth in Europe, it's going to require government intervention as well in terms of communicating the scope and magnitude mm -hmm. and just how large this need is. Yeah. Um, and then the second piece to that is mm -hmm. the other thing that I think will, if this is going to have any chance of success, it comes with a simple recognition. 
that from a geological perspective, this is the poorest continent on Earth. Um, and therefore, and you have, we're talking about some of the highest labor costs, some of the most highly regulated, the longest permitting processes. Breaking down those, bo those barriers and creating incentives <coughs> to mining are fundamental. It's not simply expedited permitting. It is going to require incentives, and it's going to require technologies. Because only with the current technologies available is it economically viable to do mining in many parts of Europe. And leveraging that technology is the only way that we can do it with the sustainability that we expect and that, that allows us to not have to compromise on environmental permitting, on the impacts to society. So. Okay, Julia? Yes, very briefly. So one, industry and local communities should work in a partnership. Two, all the best practice on how to do it is there. It's just about doing it consistently. And, and three, I think it is, and I agree that it's important that we communicate at a global scale better about trade-offs. And that education and information starts from the early age, I would add, from our educational system. Okay, clear. And last but by no means least, Maria. Yeah, I think we need to acknowledge a few of those uh, big elephants uh, in the room. One of them being the resource use of society to get that on the table and start talking about it. I think it will actually help <coughs> the issue. Uh, the other one is the historical wrongdoings, both environmental and also indigenous people's rights, to bring that up on the table and, you know, talk about that as well and how we can, can make that right. Use the best uh, technology available. It's also very important to show that this is actually more environmental friendly in Europe than it would be somewhere else. But I think my main message is that telepathic communication is overrated. It doesn't work. You need to actually you know, get out of your corner, meet people, talk to them, and not least, listen. OK, crystal clear. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah. I'll bring you down. Go on, give them another round of applause so they can walk off. Go on. Another round of applause. Right now.